But I want to just give you a little bit, and I know it's really talk about what is an exclusive workplace, but I thought it'd be helpful to talk about kind of the journey um, that we're on. And we're only at the beginning of it. We're in year three. We've certainly been, um, the employment equity legislation has certainly been applicable, applicable to the RCMP for you know two decades, more than two decades. But I'm gonna talk about really what the real journey is, and that's only year three. So I wanted to talk about the starting point, the assessment pieces that we did, the action plan, and I saw the group back there, I see the sort of recommendation action plan, and some of the lessons learned so far. And a key thing, if you remember anything, we, a lot of times we think about change, and, and you're talking about a corporate change model, and you're talking about having action plans, is to remember that change is not from here to here at all, right? Change is a little bit of this, and you're gonna cycle back, and you're gonna learn some more things, and you're gonna get feedback, and you're gonna cycle back again, so it's a, a continuous series of loops. And you need to recognize that because it's painful, and we know often unsuccessful change, right? We never really set out to achieve what we wanted to. So just to give you a little background, so um, I work out of Ottawa, um, our headquarters, and uh, sort of just jumped into a new role last week. So I'm, uh, so actually it worked out, the timing was perfect to be able to come out here. So um, our organization, 30,000 employees roughly, 20,000 of those are police personnel. We um, have provincial and territorial contracts with uh, all parts of Canada except for Ontario and Quebec. And we police over 700 communities and we're in over 40 countries. So, so that's a little bit of our background. Um, and roughly in terms, I'm gonna speak quite a bit about the, the gender aspect, but I'm gonna bring in sort of our idea of diversity and inclusion. A little bit different, builds on sort of obviously the, the four EE groups, but it's expanded and that's just been kind of our learning. Um, but so, and, in, and just at the starting point, so we are at about 21% women in terms of overall representation within, that's in the police personnel. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the culture because Deb started with the cultural aspect and, and like Deb, I'm um, equally enthusiastic about this whole dialogue of diversity and inclusion and people. Um, so late 2011 and early 2012, um, some of you may be aware, there were some very, very public stories about sexual harassment, bullying, exclusion that made the media. Mm -hmm. Hands up, anybody recall that? <laughs> Absolutely. So we live in a bit of a fishbowl, right? Yes. Live in a bit of a fishbowl, so careful everything that you do. So it um, became very, very public and um, you know, quite shocking for people. And uh, the initial perception was that's over in BC, right? That stuff's happening in BC. Um, and within a very short period of time, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back between these two points because because we live in a fish pool, there's absolutely, there was public outcry around that. Anybody ever watch This Hour Has 22 Minutes? <laughs> What's the, the woman there that wears the funky uh, warrior princess uniform? So she happened to have come to an event with us, had too much wine, come almost, almost like Elizabeth, Elizabeth May last weekend. Um, <laughs> not quite the same scenario. But so she started bashing the commissioner, right? So you've got the starting point, public allegations. She comes to a, a venue with our senior officers and starts talking about, Commissioner, what are you doing to your women? You're bullying, you're harassing women. What are you doing? Um, and she was actually the keynote speaker. It was actually kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, she was quite tame. But it just demonstrated very quickly the perceptions of here's an institution out to right, protect and serve Canadians. And there's something going on in terms of not protecting their own sort of women at that point in time. Um, and the commissioner actually, so part of his, and this is again around a change process, part of your first point is, of change is understanding what's going on. You need to understand what's going on. So the commissioner actually um, set out to undertake a cultural assessment. And, and the, the beauty of the conversations that you had here this morning is, and I'm glad to see um, white men in the room. Because traditionally when we've gone about sort of some of this, this conversation, we've excluded white men. And even if you look at the four groups, you're not there, <laughs> right? You're not there. So it was an important part to find out what are the experiences of people in the organization. Uh, it took you know, several months and, it, and it's an ongoing process, but what are the experiences of the people? Um, you know, in terms of being excluded, harassed, marginalized, right from um, white heterosexual man being a little bit effeminate and being excluded, being picked on, because what do you think the culture of the RCMP is? If you were to guess, how would you describe it? Macho, absolutely, macho, masculine, male, white, um, huge emotional self-regulation requirement. You don't put your hand up that you're feeling bad. So PTSD and mental health issues you know, became quite, quite prominent. But that was really key in terms of establishing a foundation to say, you know, these are the different types of experiences that are actually going on. Um, and, I'll, and so I'll sort of share a personal story. 
I'm from New Brunswick. I started out in Vegreville, Alberta. Anybody know where the big egg is? <laughs> right? I guarded the egg for two years. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, not a crack in it. Um, so, I mean, I come out from sort of rural part of the country, and I never thought about gender. Right? I never thought about gender till I landed. And I was telling, I think, Heather back there is that, uh, so one, it's a Ukrainian community. And what do, we, what do we know about the older generation of Ukrainian men? They like rye. Sorry? They like rye. <laughs> they like rye. They like the progress. They're not going to come to a woman in a position of authority. Right? So I first realized that, you know, and they would come in, can I talk to one of the fellows? But what I also realized that women have been, so police officers, female police officers have only been in the RCMP for 41 years. So even when I started, so in 1992, so I was 12, um, <laughs> in 1992 was very much, uh, so the, I was the only woman there. So the, then it, the men, it was very much about what they would say, 1974, what the hell were we thinking? Right? Mm -hmm. so it was very much about being macho. It was a macho, it was a man's world. So I never thought about any of that. And they would talk about um, examples of women who had failed. And examples of women who had failed in other detachment as, an, as a validation that women should not have been allowed in policing. 18 years after, you know, there was a, one of the commissioners had actually um, passed sort of a, a recruitment sort of change in policy for women to come in. So any, any and I'll speak to women, any women in particular have found yourself in a situation that you felt that, or others felt that you didn't belong, what did you do? What was your reaction? Stay quiet. Stay quiet. You might have excluded yourself from other women. I'm not one of them. I can perform, right? I'm not one of them. So these are things that I started to, I never appreciated. Stayed away from women's groups, um, downplayed. So I used to joke for a long time, I'm a woman in comfortable shoes, all the high heels are gone, right? Want to hide some of your femininity. And that's what was, and that's the part about sort of the exclusion that, you know, our journey really the last three years. And me on a personal level, as my role, um, I reported to the commissioner, my responsibility was to help us drive this change. But in this, the stories that were coming out, and, and, and the one thing I'll really sort of impart, it's the insider-outsider group. So um, in our world, we have sworn police officers and we have civilians. So if you're a police officer, male or female, you're an insider. If you're not like a civilian, you're an outsider. So all of it, every one of you in this room is an insider-outsider in some regard, right? So this conversation was powerful to appreciate the experiences of people and understand why people were excluded. And you talked about it, conscious and unconscious biases, stereotypes that we carry about gender, um, masculinity, sexuality, race, age, right? And I was telling, I was telling Deborah, um, when I first, so uh, along with the, you know, what happened in 1974, even as a young sort of female, well, sure, I mean, I've got good ideas. Um, the comment would be, you know, I've got socks older than you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so in other words, right, don't share any ideas. But that was really, really important. So that, that is a foundational piece. If you think about a corporate change model, that is pivotal to understand the experiences of people and share them. And so, and I'm going to jump to this and come back. So one of the mistakes that me, we made, well, we can actually have an online course. We're, we're you know, we're, we're throughout Canada, we're international, we need some form of mechanism to start to create the awareness and starting to move towards this sort of an action plan of what to do. This conversation cannot occur online. So that, again, that's one lesson learned to impart. It cannot, because you don't have the richness of the dialogue. When someone describes, this is what I felt like to be excluded. And it can be as simple as, even in our world, we had white men, and that's, that's why our definition of um, diversity is beyond the four. It's anything about us that makes us different. That is our definition of diversity in the RCMP. So you could be someone with a master's degree in a group of people that have grade 12 in terms of policing, and that's okay. So those are the types of things that were really important. So, um, so I want to, and I'm gonna come back to this. So the assessment piece is really, really critical. The unfortunate thing is because we live in a fishbowl, the Minister of Public Safety sent a letter out publicly I don't know if anybody saw that. We had 19 days to create an action plan, right? You will fix this. You will have 30% women. So, and, we'll, and um, if you have time for questions, you can talk about that. But he said, you will fix this. You will have 30% women. You're going to actually put in place um, some processes to obviously address the, uh, the harassment issue. And what I should say, in this assessment process, so we, we, not only will we learn about the stories, and, and quite frankly, um, I was hearing a lot of those stories myself in my role face to face. I couldn't sleep for weeks. Some of those stories were so powerful and I'm thinking, you know, where was I for, 
you know, 20 years at that point in time. Where was I not to know those experiences that people had in terms of in the workplace being excluded? That's your powerful motivator when you understand, wow, that person came into work every day. And I used to say to people, when you have that knot in your stomach on a Sunday afternoon and getting up and going into work the next day, something's terribly wrong, right? They were sick, PTSD, huge mental health issues. But in here also what we understood and, and this is the part about the cultural piece, we understood that we had a significant organizational tolerance for harassment. Tolerance for harassment because of the culture, the masculinity, the, you know, almost the, the notion around, um, how many here actually work in a very hyper-masculine kind of organization? Few, of it, right? Used to. Used to. Any, anything I say I'm resonating a little bit? You know, very fun focus on masculinity, um, sexual bra bravado to a certain extent, power, authority, so all those things. So huge issues around organizational tolerance. People would not come forward for fear of reprisal. No one was held accountable. Right? And you talked about it already, the accountability. Deborah talked about the accountability piece, fundamental in terms of that. So these are all the things of understanding. It's like, whoa, Houston, we got a problem. The warrior princess was right, you know, we got some problems here. But in the action plan, and I'll speak to this and I'll be conscious of time. In the action plan, we looked at really three key areas. So we looked at the structural pieces, and you actually referenced them this morning. So we really looked at the structural pieces and to understand um, that obviously the policies needed to change. We had, um, so probably gender neutral policies, but how they were applied weren't. So think about it, you've referenced quite a bit about the middle management. The middle management are the implementers of policy. If they're not on board, nothing happens, right? So that was a really important piece to recognize that. Um, what are these sort of the performance management mechanisms that need to be put in place? How are we going to assess and hold people accountable to make sure that they actually, um, you know, that they allow those flexible work opportunities? So it really was around that change in recruitment, targeted recruitment. It was actually making sure they had really tight harassment policies, holding people accountable. And one of the interesting pieces that we really looked at, because it was so public, and the stories, some of them were so horrendous, and, and, and I still don't think there's a really good understanding of how um, stark some of the stories were, was um, really about being in here and recognizing that we have to focus on then redefining what kind of workplace we need to have. So in here, a lot of, um, and I think it's quite topical now, is a notion of respectful workplace. So it very much was around, you know, understanding this is no longer acceptable. And our commissioner, he, you know, he'll admit it. He stuck his foot in his mouth a couple of times. And some of the things saying that um, when you think about the RCMP, you think about the red, right? The red tunic, the Mountie, especially here in Western Canada. We were just talking this morning about the March West, right? That, that huge historical component. That's not acceptable, what we found there. So this was very much on how do we then redefine the workplace we want to have. So we recognize we're not inclusive. What diversity meant to us was counting people, and it wasn't about making them count. That's the different, that's the inclusive piece. You make the people count, no matter what type of diversity they have. So we recognize in there, absolutely, we had to completely um, sort of shift that and focus on, you know, we know we're here, and it's not pretty. And the people that we serve, and the people that, um, that work with us to sort of uh, deliver on our mission, they deserve better. So then it was, it was deciding that we, knew to be, we need to move towards being much more inclusive. And that's why the definition of diversity changed. So um, have you ever been in a meeting where you have some people, they have their first speaker, speaker advantage? Do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So you have somebody who might be in the position of authority, have a lot of rank on their shoulder, or they might be the highest person in your organization, will decide sort of what the direction you're going in and no one else speaks, where you have the bobbleheads? Right on, right? Great idea. I'm with you, right? I'm with you on board. So it's to recognize all of that. We've got to change a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, does that make any sense? And if you have questions, I think we're going to try and weave them in a little bit. But I, I just want to kind of touch to these pieces here. Um, so we really looked at, in the action plan, it was about the culture and the composition of the RCMP. And I've heard people speak in the back, and it's interesting, the comments you talked about, people afraid to self-identify. Right? That's all because of some of the cultural stuff and some of the stereotypes that have created that, right? For the, you know, for the first time, my career, I'm okay to say, I'm a female police officer. It's okay, right? I mean, that's, it took me almost 23 years to say that. So it was very much for us was out the culture and the composition of the RCMP because you can't become inclusive unless you actually change your composition. And um, probably up until about two years ago, I would never have said I agree with targets. I absolutely agree with targets. And some people say, really? And I see her the face. 
Absolutely, because you cannot convince me we do not have competent people within the organization. We've got to pull them up. And that's the response to that, is the response to saying, you know, if you pick targets, you're going to get people that don't, don't deserve to be in those positions. And I, and I don't buy that, right? There are good, competent people. How do we pull them up, et cetera? So we really had to look at how do we change the composition and how do we change the culture? Because that's what starts to bring you between a more inclusive organization, right? It's not just about numbers. Again, it's got to be about how you treat each other. Um, and an interesting thing, and I'm, so I'm going to come to another part that we actually just started, because again, I said when you come through the action plan, and quite frankly, a lot of it in the beginning was very tactical. When, it, when the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister, you're in a fishbowl, you're going to take action, it's going to be quite tactical to begin with. It's putting in place some policies and things like that. But the conversations that really need to happen take a lot longer time. Right? I mean, is this the first conversation, that, for people in the room, is this the first time you've had this type of conversation? Few of you, how many, is it, how many in here is it a first time? Come? Have you had this in your organization? Right, Some ha right. that's the difference, right? That's the difference. That type of conversation and the understanding takes a long time. So we did a lot of things that I talked about, changes in policies, bring in flexible work. We use employee re resource groups. We've been using them for probably 15 years, right? Not gonna make a difference unless the culture starts to change. And the one thing that I heard you talk about, and it was interesting to see on your, when you did sort of your little responses to the survey, you spoke about the unconscious biases. Absolutely. So we introduced, um, and if you ever really keen on it, and certainly through Corey, inclusive leadership. So we've just introduced, our whole approach to leadership is now about inclusive leadership. And it starts with, um, so when it starts with a conversation around, you know, where we are as an organization, and where do we want to be, and it starts with understanding what diversity and inclusion is in a different definition of diversity than you know, what you might see at a textbooks or at an employment equity uh, legislation. Very much around that. And then it gets into an understanding of the conscious and unconscious biases. How many did the implicit association test? Hey, anybody uh, surprised by your results? I, was, I brought it up actually because I was. I heard you. Yeah, and so the gender one you did, right? <coughs> Yeah, because you can go on, you can do sexuality, you can do race, et cetera. But that was, so the same thing that you did, and that's actually came with. But when we start talking about inclusive leadership, because all those policies are great, but they mean nothing if people really aren't on board and, and embrace the concept. And I should mention in here, a really important thing that you need to do is, one, understand your starting point, understand where you're going to go, why does that matter? So, and you could use the arguments because it's a social justice argument, but you need to find a compelling case for change. Why does that actually matter? How do you, how do you touch what people care about in an organization? Instead of saying, because I heard, was it um, Chris, you talked about the stick? The stick will get you so far, right? You need to touch the emotional side of people. Why does it matter that we have a diverse organization? Why does it matter that we are inclusive? That's a really important piece in there. So the problem you guys have, I mean, I was very disappointed when I saw the results of the OECD, like I am with the armed forces now. Yeah. Okay? And you look at all the social unrest in the states, yeah. racial profiling, the public yeah. picking on, okay? Yeah. But it all comes back, like you said, to culture as well. Yeah. It was tolerated. Yeah. People don't change their attitudes. You guys need to replace people. And you talked about the middle managers yeah. again, but you just don't have middle managers. Like if I want to go hire a middle manager, it's easy. How do you go find a middle manager, RCMP police officer? Just doing these little, like, this is a big exercise. You know. So the interesting thing, so because policing, and, uh, and this is good, but, but because policing is a paramilitary organization, yeah. and again, and we, you can, I mean, we could go on for days about what's happening in the U.S. I'm doing a great research piece on that. But because we're paramilitary, when we set the tone about we will no longer tolerate this, that changes, and trust me, that changes. And the one thing that our commissioner, a new commissioner came in, he set the tone. We will no longer tolerate that behavior. In the past, we did. And people should have been fired, and there's stories of people that were working here in Alberta, got transferred to BC, that should have been fired. That changes the tone. But that on its own is not enough. But that's a starting point to set the tone. We don't tolerate this anymore. You adapt, and I think this group pack back here talked about the code of conduct pieces. It needs to be very, very um, um, clear in what the consequences are. If you do this, you'll be fired. So we changed, actually, which is a, is a, a nightmare in itself, um, federal legislation, the RCMP Act, to allow for people to be terminated. But it, it's a start. But it's a start. If, I, if I'm racist and you're my employer, how are you going to stop being a racist or you're going to be fired? So I stop. But you know what? Internally, 
I mean, values yep. haven't changed. You know, at some point in time, that, that toxic nature needs to be moved out of the organization. Absolutely. And so there's mechanisms to do that now. But the, the part of that, so like there's, and the one thing you'll find in, in a corporate change, so there are some great corporate change plans, and we use probably a multicultural organizational development model. Love it. Great corporate change plans. There is no one size fit all. Every organization is different, right? No two organizations will be able to implement it the same way. But part of it is to understand, like it, it is, a, I mean, you have to work through a number of different things, the structural, behavioral, cultural interventions that need to come into place in here to really start to work around that. And I heard a couple of groups really talk about sort of that groundswell. This ground, groundswell can be positive in here when you've got top cover right from the boss to say, we don't tolerate this anymore, to show to demonstrate examples when someone has done something and they are fired or ser serious sanctions, you start to demonstrate that, the dialogue opens up where people start to say, we want to change the workplace. Then you, when you bring in the inclusive leadership piece and people start to talk about sort of the conscious and unconscious biases, I don't believe people intentionally, so in some cases, absolutely criminal, get the hell out, right? <laughs> you don't deserve to wear the red coat anymore. Um, but you don't, right? It's a symbol of Canada. You don't deserve to serve Canadians. So, but when you start to work through it, but other people unintentionally, because when you think about um, who has a higher social status just in, in society, men or women? Men. And when we raise little girls and boys, how do we generally raise boys compared to women? Assertive. Sorry? They're allowed to be more assertive and more yeah. Actually, yeah. What happens with what happens with little girls if they get too bossy? You're told that they're aggressive. You're told that you're bitchy. You're in the double bind, right? So some it's to recognize some of those things that have come in. So they come in from society. So it's not like all these things emerged in any organization. They're a societal influence of how we've grown up, and, and certainly when you're bringing in sort of a cultural mix. But when you add in a very hyper masculine culture, wow! And it's to unpack that and understand it. And you can only do it through dialogue. You can't do it in an online course. That's the most pivotal thing that you actually can do. You know, you have leadership support, you have all your mechanisms in place, you have all your structural interventions in place, but the dialogue around, you know, what does this actually mean? And also, we delivered our first for executive leadership session on inclusive leadership Monday. All right, so we just started on, so we just started on that part. It was working through all this stuff, this painful stuff, really tough, sledding, painful stuff, um, to work on the inclusive leadership piece. Powerful. Right, really, really powerful when you start to talk about when people did their implicit association test. You know, and there's always few women, there might be two or three in the room. But imagine women saying, you know, um, how many here, if you're brave, had a strong association with men and career and women and family? Anybody do that one? Yeah, you were the other way? No association. Yeah, so, but even women were coming out strong association with men and a career. So, how does that affect you in, your leader, in a leadership role? So this is the conversation we're talking about. When we select people, who do we generally select? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's called an affinity bias or similarity uh, attraction bias. We select people who are like us. So it's educating, you talked about the awareness piece, right? Educating people about that to understand, you know, why are things the way they are? There's a cultural aspect, there's an organizational cultural aspect, and there's things that we've been carrying from, you know, stereotypes of biases in terms of how we've, how we've grown up. Really, really a sort of powerful piece, you know, around that. And I want to talk about what our lessons learned and then allow opportunity for some um, sort of some questions around that because we're doing a bit of a drive-by. Um, and I talked, so, okay, so you talked a little bit about um, the leadership piece. I think one group here, who talked about the leadership commitment quite a bit? Number of people? Um, like really, really important here. So to go back to your point here, and I want to really, really stress that, you'll never, ever get anywhere. Like this is a long-term process. You're obviously in the, in the diversity inclusion business. It's a long-term process, right? It's, it's not something that's going to happen in a couple of years. It's a long-term. And generally, organizations and organizational leaders don't have patience for that. There's too many fires we're trying to put out. We're trying to move on to the next issue. So you really have to recognize that and have commitment for the long haul. That's sort of a lesson learned on that. Um, and the interesting, so when I talk about why does it matter for, um, and everybody in here is, so our focus has been on women, but it's really about the diversity of thought. Again, I mentioned that, and, and to really reinforce that and find reasons. I think I've heard some, some people talking about they found advantages from women in supply chain or even in trucking and some of those aspects for safety records. All those things to equate it to operational outcomes. 
would be rec the sort of lesson learned. You need to equate that to operational outcomes. How does that help us get better at the business? How does that help us in terms of the people that we serve? And sort of the, sort of the mantra that we have, if you really want to effectively serve the community, you need to represent the community. Key thing, right, for a whole host of reasons, but really, really important around that. Um, and there's a couple of things I want to talk about here. I talked about the insider outsider. Um, and, and I just want to, so the last point I want to talk about includes it, and then I'll open it up to questions. But these are things, some things I wanted to share based on sort of your commentary here. Um, in the inclusive leadership, you talked about what are some of the inclusive leadership behaviors. There are some really great research on inclusive leadership. Um, anybody heard of the organization Catalyst? Mm -hmm. So we actually started working with Catalyst a year ago, a nonprofit organization. Um, the Canadian Forces are now sort of working with them in terms of reaching out to people to, you know, have. And it's interesting, we're a very hyper-masculine organization, paramilitary and all the baggage that comes with that. There are some good things, um, but it's sort of really reaching out to different organizations to really, how do we sort of collectively move on sort of this journey to understand because the biases and stereotypes are sort of consistent. The barriers tend to be consistent. You know, the things that you've talked about are the same things our folks have spoken about around that. Um, but on the inclusive leadership, and here's something you think about it, um, courage. So if you're going, to be, uh, if you're going to be an inclusive leader, and th these are the things that we're, we have now introduced in our inclusive leadership model, um, we talk about for the leaders in the organization at all levels, you need to be courageous because when you're pushing forward to talk about being inclusive and doing things differently, you're going to get challenged. So some of the people you talk about, you're disappointed to hear that? Absolutely. Right? You will get challenged from people saying, why does it matter? Why are we, giving, why are we going to a gay pride parade? What the hell is that? Right? You'll have things like that actually come out. So you need to have courage. You need to have humility as, a, as an inclusive leader, so you think about yourself and your leadership roles. You need to have humility because you need to be open to criticism, feedback, and different ideas on how to do things. Right? Just because you're the top dog doesn't mean you have the, all the answers how to do things. So these are things that we've really you sort of worked on. And the other part is, is the empowerment piece. So there's, like, there's four actually sort of behavioral traits. But the empower piece is, empowerment piece is allowing people to do their best work. Right? Allowing people just to, to fill their full potential, to actually excel, and to know that they could be at the top of the organization, regardless where you come from, regardless what your bank baggage is, and regardless how you think or your leadership style. And then the last piece there is the accountability. So the accountability piece, that's, you know, that's the crux of it all. We, our starting point, we didn't have the accountability. We allowed some behaviors, terrible, terrible behaviors to occur over a period of time, a lot of harm done to people, people left the organization. Right, all the retention issues you can actually think about, to now move forward and say, you know, all the structural interventions, the behavioral interventions, the training, the real strong cultural piece now, and then focusing on sort of inclusive leadership with the right performance management mechanisms in there to say, what does success look like? Yes. And if you're, um, do you use a diversity inclusion index? Yes. So there's some great things you can look at. How do you know whether or not, you know, that you have sort of the numerical aspect or the normative aspects? How do you know that people feel regardless of what their background is, that this is an organization that they can come in and do their best work. Those are the things you have to measure. So those are the, the mechanisms that have been put in place. It's a long-term journey. We've been in it three years. Um, we'll still be going at it when I you know, leave in the next little while. That's the reality. It's a long-term journey. And the interesting thing, the reason why so many organizations don't, aren't successful because it is too long. Mm -hmm. It's too complicated and they give up, they get impatient, just like any sort of regular change process. Too, too long. Um, any questions sort of around that? And this is, I know I'm kind of expired, but any questions sort of around sort of the approach or sort of the um, lessons learned or, and, and I think, sorry, Corey was talking about being a best practice. They're just lessons learned. You know, you know, all organizations are working at different things and, you know, we share sort of those different types of experiences. Yes, Linda. How do you do this kind of organic work in the fishbowl and the authentic at the same time? So you, I'm just thinking about your, your description of You've got 31 days to come up with an actual... 19. Sorry, I But, you know, to be authentic and to be genuine and to be honest to the people and yet have that, that heavy hand above you and the rest of us as citizens. So yep. how do you, what's the balance there? The, the challenge is, so, so our commissioner, and I, and I, and I said, um, he came from a very, you talk about type A, hyper-masculine type of personality. Anybody seen sort of videos of him? Mm -hmm. um, I teach a we women in management course at Carleton, and I always play videos of him, and they're like, whoa, scary, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's a scary guy. 
Um, but extraordinarily confident. And like this to him, this matters. So he played, he had, uh, took top cover. So he was public, you know, and if we look back at it, rightly or wrongly, but he was the very public face while people could just do the work. And we try not to talk about it because the, the worst thing you can do is keep talking about it publicly where we're going to do this is just do it, mm -hmm. right? Do it. And then those stories can start to come out. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you were to talk to different people in the organization, uh, absolutely, you're going to hear different stories and a long way to go yet. But you'll hear some things around, wow, you know what? We sure take the whole notion of respect in the workplace a lot more seriously as a starting point, you know, and now moving on to that. But that was very much had to happen. But you guys, honestly, and it's terrible that you got that publicity, but it was a blessing of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when you have a crisis, yeah. then it defines urgency. Right, never waste a crisis. Yeah, right. Nothing moves very fast. No. It would have taken another 20 years for you guys to make the change. Now you had a choice. Yep. A leader who is committed. And a crisis, you know what? We need to fix this. We need to fix it now. Everybody's watching. That's, That's right. How you get results. And, so, and so the challenge for other organizations, and you're absolutely, like I was saying, never waste a good crisis. And I will absolutely publicly say that we would never have gone down this path without those lawsuits. Absolutely not. Because we are working at Diversity 101, let's just count the widgets, sort of thing, right? Um, but, it, but when you're not in that environment, then, so we were under, we had the urgency. If you look at John Cotter's sort of change management model, we had the sense of urgency, for sure. You still have to go a long way to convince people it actually matters to do it. Because we had, and quite honestly to your point, but we had very interesting statements come out, like, okay, all women apply, it's the year of the vagina. Um, like those type, right? And you've all heard it, those type of sort of really stupid and... Uh, nonsensical sort of comments that come out, but that's sort of result of that. Um, but when you don't have that sort of crisis, then you have to think about how do you really create the case for change, that you disrupt the status quo. That's, so that's where you have to spend some time. What's your compelling <laughs> argument to say, you know, this can be better, we can have a better organization. That's the challenge. And so, you know, we obviously had the urgency to start. Um, any other questions? And um, then you want to wrap up and get out of here. Yes, Corey. One more question? Very good. Anyway, so, but happy to share any information. You have any other questions on that? Um, quick and dirty sort of snapshot of sort of where we're at and what we've done. Mm.